38, 36. So they took Jesus in the boat and started out, leaving the crowds behind, although other boats were following. But soon in a fierce storm came up, high waves were breaking into the boat, and it began to fill with water. Jesus was sleeping at the back of the boat with his head on a cushion. The disciples woke him up, shouting, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? When Jesus woke up, he rebuked the wind and said to the waves, Silence, peace, be still. Suddenly the wind stopped and there was a great calm. Then he said to them, Why are you afraid? Do you still have no faith? The disciples were absolutely terrified. Who is this man? They asked each other. Even the wind and waves obey him. The reason I think this was a special op by Jesus is because the disciples had not yet learned who he was. Oh, yeah, they, they saw him turn water into wine. They, they seen him heal people. Later on, they would see him, you know, passing out uh, fish and bread to more people than they were supposed to with just a few fish and bread. I mean, they would see everything. They would later on see his death, later on see his resurrection. But in this moment, Christ was trying to teach them something else. But they needed to be in a place where they had no control. Can I share with you that, that when God wants to teach you something, when God has a special op for you, it's to help you get through difficult times for those days or moments as well as for the future. There will be storms. Where will your faith be? 
Now, it doesn't mean that if you have faith, it still won't be hard. It doesn't mean that you have to run to him and say, Lord, don't you really care about me? He knows how we are. He doesn't mind us being human. But he wants us to learn that in the moments when we have no control, he does. So there will be storms. You can just mark that in your Bible. You're going to have storms. But where will your faith be? And so Jesus is training his disciples. He wants them to know there will be storms. But the big question is, will you have faith? If you want to go a little later over in that uh, 40th verse, Jesus asks him, why are you afraid? And then this very it's a profound statement, a truthful statement that only Jesus could actually make. But he says, do you still have, he doesn't say faith, do you still have no faith? It's a, it's a really an indictment against the disciples. They're following Jesus. Why would Jesus even confront them? Because this is a moment to teach them that when they don't have control, Jesus does. And it's important for us to know that our faith, even though it may be small and tiny, even a, 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 a faith the size of a, a mustard seed can tell that movement to be removed and it will be gone. Just imagine the little faith, infinitesimal faith that we have had at times. And we said, Lord, where are you? How, how come you're not fin doing something? How are you not praying? How are you answering this prayer? The storm, there will be storms. Where will your faith be? That's the question. And then here's the question we have for him. Jesus, don't you care? That's really a hard one to get answered. Don't you care? Number one, it's okay to pray that. It's okay. Because the Lord needs us to know where we are in this. And when we say that, that if we know him, if we're following him, if maybe he's been a distant Savior, but he's still in our life. When we say, don't you care, immediately the Holy Spirit speaks if we're listening to him. Immediately Jesus calls out to the storm if we're listening to him. But if this question is asked of Jesus and we have no tight relationship with him. If it's not current, then there probably isn't going to be this guilt for even asking that question. It's still okay to ask because when we ask that question, all, that begins to open it because that's a prayer. You should know it, but that's a prayer. Jesus, don't you care? Because you're talking to him. That opens up at least begins to open up the portal between your heart and the heart of heaven. And, and Jesus then has opportunity, if you're willing to hear, willing to listen. Jesus, don't you care? Because probably he'll come back with something like, I do, but why don't you live for me? Why don't you trust me? Why aren't you committed to me? Where have you been in your life over the past year? If you're listening. If you're not listening and you want to go about doing your own work and you want to accuse Jesus, Jesus, don't you care? Oh, you'll be able to pray that prayer with a lot of angst and a lot of pain and hurt, even bitterness. But praying that prayer may be the opportunity Jesus has to speak to you and say, 
I have been here all along. But you haven't listened. You haven't obeyed. You haven't been committed. I like this question because there are so many different ways that Jesus can help us wherever we are in our growth. When the disciples went to Jesus, who was <clears throat> asleep in the boat, I've never been in a boat and tried to sleep. I've never been in a boat that much. I've been on the boat out in Galveston and felt little waves against the boat. That's about all. I can't imagine sleeping in that boat. I can't imagine sleeping in a boat in a storm. Lightning flashing. Thunder rolling, waves coming over the boat. He must have been in a very deep sleep. But the disciples, I'm not sure why they asked that question, teacher, don't you care that we're going to drown? I'm not even sure what they expected Jesus to do. Because if they believed that he could, you know, he could stop the storm any moment, they would have, they would have said, hey, Jesus, and they wouldn't have been afraid, and they would have said, Lord, it's, hey, it's kind of rocky out here. Hey, would you mind, you know, doing your thing? <laughs> would you mind doing the miracle? But no, they're scared to death that they're going to die. And now they say to Jesus, don't you care that we're going to try? Do, don't they know who's in the boat? Uh that is a greater question. Don't you know who's in your life? Don't you know that Jesus is Lord of all? Well, Pastor, he really hasn't helped me when I needed him the most. I doubt that. I really doubt that. God has been with you every moment of every day. And whether you realized it or not, maybe. Have you seen that picture where the, the, the footsteps are in the sand? It starts with four footsteps and ends up there's only two. And the story behind that is that, you know, the, uh, the, 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 the guy was praying, Lord, where are you? I'm just doing this by myself. And Jesus, and the, and the response was, Jesus says, I'm carrying you. And how many times have we been carried and didn't even know it? It is a it is it is a great it is a great moment of faith that just begins to burst out through our life when we realize that when we're going through the storm of whatever that storm is, Jesus is there. He may seem asleep to you, but he knows everything that's going on. He knows the storm that's in your life. He knows the losses that have been in your life. He knows the hard times that you've had financially. He knows how difficult the relationships have been in your life. He knows things at work have not been the best in the world because you haven't had great bosses and you've been the scapegoat because you claim to be a Christian. Hear the words of Jesus in the middle of all your storms. Peace. And in the Greek, those, those three words are together. But in the translation, it seems to want to be peace and then be still. Peace. It's a muzzling, a quieting, a silencing. It's a speechlessness. It's an involuntary stillness. Peace. Be still. Silence. Silence is golden in the midst of the storm because Jesus pronounces the silence that you don't have any control over.
You know, this is Shelly's birthday, if you didn't know. Um, August 15 through 24, 25, I didn't know if I was going to get to celebrate her birthday. Many times that I prayed, it was just uh, it was just a difficult thing in those first few days. So when I saw her come out of the operating room the second time, it didn't look like anything was good was going to happen at all. Doctor came up to me. He said, I know she doesn't look very good right now, but just have hope. And he was a Jewish guy. Just have hope. I think that's what doctors and nurses are supposed to be for in the hospital. Not to wake you up at 3 o'clock in the morning, but to let you know there's hope. But while she was in that surgery, I was down at uh, Methodist Hospital in the chapel. And um, it was a really special ops moment for my life. I uh, didn't know what life would be like after Shelley. I didn't want to accept it. I didn't know, didn't know how it was going to turn out, and I just, I was scared. I didn't know what was going to happen. I tried to put on a good face. I tried to be strong, but in that chapel, I, I just lost it all. I said, Lord, I can't do anything for her. I don't know how to help her. And uh, that's when I heard Jesus say, you can't. I can't. Well, what do I have to do, Lord? Then he reminded me of what happened in the Garden of Gethsemane. And I shared this with you when we, in the Sundays after. I had to pray the prayer that Jesus prayed in the garden. Not my will, but your will be done. I think in those moments when Jesus prayed, he understood the, the stillness and the peace of his own relationship with the Father, just as he was trying to teach his disciples in this moment when they were on the water, on the lake, at night, in the midst of a storm, when it looked like nothing good was going to happen. And Jesus, he spoke to the winds, he spoke to the waters, and he said, peace, be still. And as I prayed in that chapel, it took a long time to say, your will be done, not mine. I could never see my life without. I could see my life with Jesus, but not without her. But when I said, not my will, your will be done, I broke from trying to handle all of that myself. And so many people prayed and having given the strength and encouragement and people praying and you were here and you helped and you, you encouraged and you strengthened me. But what I had finally was a real peace in the midst of a storm that I didn't have any way of getting out except by his grace. And I had to continue to trust him. And to this day, I, I've kept her head and her body in his hands, knowing that it's his will always. He will always do in her what's best and what's right. That's, that's what we have to hear when we go through our most difficult, hard times. When it seems like it's darkness and there's no light. I didn't ask that question, why, Lord, we're in the midst of something here. Why can't you help? I was able to get to that point where I could say, Lord, not my will, but yours. And that's when he said, 
peace. And it wasn't to me, it was what I was going on, what was going on in my mind and in my heart. I could not, I could not do anything with that. And he said, peace. <laughs> she can do whatever she wants. That doesn't matter to me. I don't care. I'm glad that she is with us. Why are you afraid, and do you still have no faith? When Jesus says, peace be still, he always has that little caveat that says, why are you afraid? I've been here the whole time. I'll help you the whole time. I'll be with you. Let's stand. Let's sing this song as our benediction. Rise and thunders roar. I will soar with you.